Good evening, I'm Mike Param, the Executive Director of the Army Heritage Center Foundation. We're the Friends Group for the U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center, the Army's premier research facility uh, that's dedicated to bringing in collections of soldier stories and their artifacts and re their uh, recorded memories. Tonight uh, is a slightly different program. Uh, this isn't, uh, in a sense, a lecture uh, by a single author on a topic. It is rather three colleagues from Gettysburg College who have uh, worked to bring in uh, the holdings of a World War I British officer and make them accessible, but then also talk a bit about how they plan to use those as an educational product. Uh, since it's three folks uh, speaking tonight, I will let them uh, introduce themselves. So Ian, if you want to start, and then uh, RC and Amy, uh, you, can, you can follow. All right, uh, so I am Ian Isherwood. I'm Associate Professor of War and Memory Studies at Gettysburg College. I teach courses in the History Department and the Interdisciplinary Studies Department at Gettysburg College. I teach courses having to do with war, with the memory of war. I also teach British history um, as well, uh, and some, uh, some courses on war literature and war representation. Um, I'm a specialist in the First World War, and my area of focus is on uh, the British Army in the First World War and the experience of British veterans and how they um, wrote about their experiences of war. So, R.C.? Hi, I'm R.C. Meisler. I am the Systems and Digital Initiatives Librarian at Gettysburg College. Um, I specialize in library technology and also the field of digital humanities, um, which allows us to take this sort of primary source material and turn it into um, unique public facing digital projects. And I am Amy Lucadamo. I am the college archivist. I work in special collections and college archives in Muslim and Library at Gettysburg College. And I am a generalist. I do everything from working with student interns to um, answering research requests from historians to um, assisting with digital scholarship. Thank you. So what we'd like to do this evening is to talk a little bit about a project that we've been working on for the last six years. It is the First World War Letters of HJC Peers. And we'll drop some, we'll drop a link in the chat for you so that you can have a look at, um, look at the digital project as we're talking about it. So we thought it would be interesting for us to talk about uh, the project that we've been that we've been working on, uh, we want to talk about how to conceptualize a project. So, how you take a box of items from an archive or a group or a collection from an archive, and then make a DH project on it, which you then can do some really interesting things with. So, we want to talk about how we conceptualized our project, how it's changed over the last six years that we've been working on it. Um, and how some of kind of the neat ways in which we're engaging with students and teaching military history in a small liberal arts college. Um, and then we'll finish up by talking a little bit about what we hope to do with our project in the future. So kind of the direction in which we see it going in or possibilities in which it could go in in the future. Um, so what I'm gonna do is provide an, an introduction to kind of our project and how we got into this particular topic. Amy's gonna talk a bit about the collection uh, and its richness and, and kind of uh, the creative process in which we went into of trying to figure out what we could do with a collection like this. RC is going to walk you through the website uh, and talk to you about some of the innovative things that we've been doing. We're going to circle back. I'm going to talk about military history and the teaching of military history, and then we'll finish up with uh, with hopefully some questions from you that we'll be then able to talk about um, not only the project but kind of the history behind the project, and then of course, um, and then of course any questions you have about a DH project or kind of forming a project like this on on your own if you'd be interested in doing something like that. So, RC, if we could go to the first slide. So first, just some background info about Gettysburg College for those of you who don't know much about us. So we are a small liberal arts college. We have 2,600 undergraduate students. Um, we have a lot of students, of course, who come to Gettysburg because of its name recognition and its connection to the American Civil War. So uh, we get um, a number of history majors that come in every year or potential history majors that are interested in Gettysburg as a place. Um, and, and 
Uh, and we've a, we've a very good history department that kind of punches above its weight in what we're able to offer students in terms of the history major and the history minor. We also have minors in Civil War era studies and public history. And both of those are interdisciplinary minors that kind of um, that have courses across our curriculum that then make up make up those distinctive minors that that we have. Uh, one of the aspects of teaching at a small liberal arts college is that we place particular emphasis on uh, on collaboration, um, on mentorship with students. So faculty members getting to know our students um, rather well over a four year period, mentoring them as they kind of um, emerge as scholars in their own right before we then send them out of our doors and go off into a professional field or off to graduate school. We don't. Um, uh, we don't have uh, a graduate uh, program at Gettysburg College. Well, we just we just approved one at Gettysburg College, uh, so we will have one for next year. But up until this year, we we did not have a graduate program here here at Gettysburg College. So uh, what we try to do, and especially in teaching history at Gettysburg College, is we try to utilize um, the archival resources that we have at the college, which are pretty, pretty vast and very interesting. So we have a great college archive that has a lot of different materials that our students work with. We also have archives within our region too that students, uh, that students go off and, and work in as well. So we have the, um, the Gettysburg National Military Park. Some of our students do go over to AHEC to do some research on some of their projects. So we're able to kind of utilize archives within our region for our students to be able to do some really interesting independent research. Uh, and the final point of this slide is that we also do more than just the American Civil War. So we offer a lot of courses in war and war studies and uh, the memory of war here at Gettysburg College and the legacy of war in uh, in particular. So we do, we, we do an awful lot with the teaching of war at, here at Gettysburg College and with the teaching of war and society. Uh, RC, next slide. So what I want to do is introduce you to the collection that became the basis of our, our digital history project, the First World War Letters of H.J.C. Pierce. So first things first, who is H.J.C. Pierce? Um, well, Pierce was a British Army officer who served in the First World War, rising in rank from uh, lieutenant to lieutenant colonel, and he uh, ended the war in command of the 8th Service Battalion of the Queen's Royal West Surrey Regiment. So he's in a Kitchener Battalion, a volunteer battalion. He serves throughout the duration of the war, so he's commissioned um, in September of 1914, and he ends up leaving uh, France in 1919. So he's in France from 1915 until 1919, uh, and he is in. He's in. He and his unit are in every major kind of campaign that the British Army is fighting on the Western Front from 1915 until 1918. So they're there at the Battle of Luz. They're then. Uh, engage the next year at the Somme. They then move uh, up north to uh, Messine. They then move to Ypres. They then move back down south and are involved in the spring offensive of 1918. Uh, and then they are in the final push, the 100 days uh, ending the war, um, just north of uh, kind of the, just north of kind of the Somme region is where they are when they end up finishing the war. So, so he's in every major campaign. He's very highly decorated. So he wins the DSO three times. Um, he's mentioned in dispatches six times, and uh, he's wounded three times over the course of the war. So he's an interesting soldier uh, to be able to focus on. The reason that we have his materials at Gettysburg College is because I taught his great grandson. So his great grandson came to me after class at 20th century world history course about 10 years ago. And he came to me with a box of stuff from his family and said, would you like to see uh, my relative's first world war letters? And this happens if you're a historian, people sometimes bring things to you. Or as Amy knows, if you're an archivist, they oftentimes bring things to you. Uh, and so the student brought this to me. And as I started going through the materials with the student, I realized we had a very rich collection uh, from a uh, highly decorated British Army officer that had really been in, in the thick of it for three years of combat on the Western Front. And as a First World 
poor historian, I kind of realized that this was a great collection that somebody should do something with, um, hopefully somebody at Gettysburg College, and hopefully that somebody would be me. So the student, uh, the student let me kind of go through the materials, and I got to know the student uh, rather well. Over his four years at Gettysburg College, I was his faculty advisor. I got to know his family very well, uh, and his family were very keen to be able to have us use the collection or to put the collection on loan to us while they figured out what they wanted to do with it. Uh, next slide, RC. Okay, Amy, do you want to do this one or do you want me to do it? Go for it. Okay. So initially what happened is we had a collection of materials. I had talked to the family when, when my student Marco Dracopoli graduated. I talked to his parents and said, what do you think you want to do with this material? And they, they very generously said, well, if you'd like to write a book or something based on the material, please, please do so. And as I started looking at the materials, I went and I met with my friend, classmate, and colleague, Amy Lucadamo, and said to her, um, if we were to house these materials at Gettysburg College, maybe we could do something with them. And she said, what do you think we could do with them? And I said, I don't know, maybe a project. And so we kind of batted our heads together and we settled down on the idea of doing a digital history project based on the letters. And initially we had a gimmicky idea where we said that, okay, we have letters from September 1915 until, um, the, uh, the summer of 1919, maybe we could release these letters 100 years to the day in which they were written by peers. So we could set up a website, we could put them on the website, and we could put one letter out for each day, maybe have a corresponding social media presence to be able to showcase these letters over the course of the World War I centenary. Um, and on the slide, what you see is kind of the idea of what we had and then what, what we did with the material. So one of the things that we had was timing. We received the materials in 2014-15, um, in and that corresponded with the centennial of the First World War. We had a great collection of letters, and Amy's going to go through some of the specifics of the collection. This is a very interesting collection of a lot of letters from a lively officer, a very chatty officer that writes very frankly about his experiences on the Western Front. But what we realized quickly is that the story was bigger than just one person. It's about a battalion serving on the Western Front and how they transformed over the course of the war. We also had an impulse to connect our undergraduates with this source material. So I teach a course in the First World War. I also teach courses on the experience of war. And we realized that we could use these materials materials to be able to engage students within the classroom. So we needed to figure out a way in which we were going to do that. And we'll kind of illustrate ways in which we've been trying to do that ever since. Um, we had the full support of the family in, in doing what we wanted with the collection. Um, so they said to us, you know, basically, we want you to use this material. We want students to engage with it. We want it to be open access. Amy will talk a little bit about that. Um, and then we also had a lot of freedom. So Amy and I could create a team and we initially met and we thought, well, we'd love to do a website. Well, how do we do a website? So then we brought in somebody who knew something about how to do something with a website. So we brought in R.C. Meisler, who was the systems librarian, who was a new hire at Gettysburg at that time. And we said, would you like to help us with our website? And R.C. will talk a little bit more about his role as to what that looked like. But we realized that we had a lot of freedom to collaborate across campus. We could set up our own project and run our own project and our own shot. And as Amy indicates in the slide, we had no idea what we were doing at first, but we had a de desire to learn about DH and to evolve the project as we went along over a four-year period that now is extended to a six-year period of working on the project. All right, RC, next slide. So I am going to talk a little bit about the collection itself, the actual papers that came to us. Until they were given to our team, the peers letters and assorted papers were a family collection. They were preserved first by Jack's parents, then Jack himself, then his wife, then his daughter, then his grandson, and finally his great grandson. Um, the label pictured here is in the handwriting of Irene, Jack's wife, and it states, HJCPs 1914 to 1918, maps, souvenirs, etc. exactly as I found them, all interesting for posterity. And I love this label because I feel like when I saw this label, I thought, all right, we've got all the permission from the family we need and all the permission from uh, 
Jack's wife that we need. So let's go into this project. Uh, the two men pictured uh, next to the label are Marco and Nick Tricopoli. Uh, so Jack's great grandson and his grandson. And Nick in the picture is holding one piece that he did not donate with his uh, with the papers, which is a wooden sign hand painted with the regiment's pastoral lamb on it and the words commanding officer. According to Nick, this sign was hung outside of the battalion's headquarters during the war. And he likes to keep it above his desk because it gives him a sense of command. Um, so in my experience, it's rare that a family collection like this is so complete and so well taken care of. The documents we were given include about around 300 letters, military and civilian records, artifacts like um, his officer's pips and his uh, ribbons and um, a, hat, a cat badge, trench maps and photographs. And the photographs are both pre-war, pre post-war and during the war. The bulk of the collection dates between 1915 and 1919 with outliers before and after the war again. Um, Jack's handwriting in these letters is clear and strong in almost all of the letters. He writes in both pen and pencil. Sometimes he writes in really fine stationery and sometimes he writes in his field notebook. So it's a really good example of soldiers using whatever they had on hand and the frequency with which uh, people were expected to write home. He writes to his uh, sisters, his three sisters and his parents. And most of the letters were certainly written with the understanding that they would be shared amongst the family. So occasionally there's a letter to an individual, but most of the time there are letters that are for everyone. And one of our earliest students did some excellent work analyzing how he wrote to different members of his family, what his tone was, what the topics were. So that was an area where she brought in skills from her English major and was able to uh, do a close reading of some of Jack's letters. Um, Finally, no matter what we did with the letters, the family wanted all the digital versions of them to be made available to the public really openly. Um, our use of the papers for whatever project we came up with um, was precluded with the agreement that they be placed in the public domain that, and that Gettysburg College itself would assert no restrictions on their use. And we have definitely done that. They are freely available for anyone to use, download, view, and even reproduce if they need to. Uh, next slide, please, Arcee. So this is a uh, this is a picture of the actual finished collection, and you can see here from the slide that the donation actually did happen in uh, 2019. Traditionally, an archival collection is donated, rehoused, and described before it's shared with researchers, and definitely before it's digitized and put online. So we worked in reverse with this collection and in doing so broke a few archival rules uh, by accepting a long-term loan for one, digitizing everything first for another um, before the for formal donation had been made. Um, but I can report last, as of last spring, the collection was fully processed. Uh, we had a little bit of a hiccup with COVID and all our students going home, but we continued to work on it. So it's been rehoused maps were professionally flattened and encapsulated, and a finding aid was written. Um, in addition to being able to access the letters on jackpros.org, which is this project's website, the letters and transcriptions have been added to Musselman Library's database of digital archival holdings called Get Digital. And I will put that um, URL in the chat as well. Um, and like I said, pictured here is Lizzie Hobbs, so member of the class of 2021. And she is standing with her completed archival collection, MS-250, the First World War Letters of H.J.C. Pierce. Next slide. All right. Um, so in terms of why a digital project, why create a digital project, um, the First World War Letters of H.J.C. Pierce falls under this realm of the field of digital humanities which is a way to um, take humanity, take a question and try to answer it in a digital way using um, digital tools like websites and maps and timelines and try to interpret, analyze and present materials um, in new and interactive ways. So digital tools like a website, like an interactive map, like an interactive timeline allow for more more, a wider range of interpretation and analysis than you know, taking a 
turning this into a standard research paper. Um, certainly you can take all the primary sources that are in the collection and write really, you know, probably write countless research papers, books, articles, using the material and using it as a jumping off point for other things. But, you know, by having a website that's in available to be accessible to a wide audience, we can move beyond an academic audience where a lot of academic papers and books tend to fall. You know, these books end up in academic libraries. Um, articles often are behind subscriptions that require some sort of institution to subscribe to them. A website like the Peers website is open to anyone who has internet access. And this allows us to reach um, people beyond the academy. It lets us reach folks who are just interested in history. It also helps us reach the um, families of people who um, fought in the Great War, um, including members of Jack's family, but also members of um, members of families of people who fought with Jack um, as well. What's also cool about Digital Project is that it engages us visually. Um, you know, we can write forever and try to describe all the visual resources in the collection. But if we can show them with visual materials, it just brings a more closeness, intimacy, and it really lets people draw their own conclusions as well as to the source materials. Um, another thing, great thing about digital projects is that it allows for this sort of cross-field, cross-discipline interaction. Um, you know, if someone told me in 2014 when I was hired to Gettysburg, I'd be working on a First World War history project. I don't know if I would have believed them or not. But the fact that I have, you know, that I came in with certain um, interests and abilities in um, working with websites and technology, it really helps you bring a team together and you can leverage interests in research, interest in archives, interest in technology, and sort of cross-train each other and really become conversant across a wide range of disciplines, which is really cool. Digital humanities projects are inherently collaborative. The field requires a multi multiple, um, multiple skill sets for these things to work successfully as well. Um, and this is what we call a community of practice, you know, that we are common, we have a common goal of getting, of using the materials in the collection and distributing them in a new way to a wide audience. So um, the project is, be, you know, it, it brings a lot of value to us. It brings a lot of value to our student workers as well, as we have a team that works on it instead of, you know, one person at the top who supervises a bunch of people who do work for the project. So I want to give a brief tour of the website. Um, from what you're seeing on this slide, though, too, um, it's sort of the evolution of the project. From um, on the left, you see a some a sketch of what uh, Ian was thinking about this website could be um, during one of our first meetings to talk about it. So, and this is what we call in web development a wireframe because you're creating you know creating little boxes and trying to figure out what a website looks like. Um, and it has it. Ian's uh, wireframe actually translated pretty well to our modern website um, in terms of the types of navigation and elements that we have. So I want to give a pre brief tour of the site just so you know what is going on with it. Um, all right. So the homepage um, introduces the site. Um, we have a couple of pages here about Jack himself. Um, just a brief introduction to him. We also have an about the project where we have um, talk about our, our reasoning why we did this project. Um, we're also proud of the fact that we include our, all of our, any research st assistant student who has worked for the project gets credit and remains credit on the website. And our role has been, the staff role has grown quite a bit over um, the last few years. Um, the highlight of the project, of course, are the letters. Um, and we've actually expanded beyond the letters, and I'll talk about this in a minute. Um, but all of the letters were posted 100 years to the day of when um, they were written. So if I go into November 19, or 2018, we can see letters that were written by Jack 
in November 1918. So 100 years to the day. Um, we can see, let me get to, so this is the letter that Jack wrote on the armistice. And each letter has a transcription. Um, you can click on the letter and get a blown up version of it um, to read it a little bit easier. The transcriptions include links to outside websites that also bring additional context to the letters as well. Um, and select letters also have commentary um, that the team has written um, about that particular letter as well. We also have something we call chatting, um, which is things like commentary. Um, so um, a little later I'll talk about some memorialization, but also um, letters that we have um, commentary. We have some, one of our students did a tutorial of one of the maps that he made, um, more maps. Um, we have um, talking about transcription. So how do you transcribe these letters as well? We have some movie reviews of great war films that we've also talked about. The soldier profiles um, are one of our more newer innovations where we decided we, after we exhausted the letters of Jack's letters, you know, we still have, you know, almost 1200 men who we can talk about. So Lizzie Hobbs compiled a giant spreadsheet and has pulled the names of the men together. And if you click on these, you know, different Profiles, we have a short profile based off of what information we could find about the different soldiers that Jack um, served with. And sometimes these have more information than others because we're able to find information about them in newsletters, uh, in newspapers, or other primary source materials. Sometimes we don't have quite as much. Um, the maps are sort of a key component to the website. We do a lot with, with thinking about space and how um, Jack. Um, his existence and his interaction with the battlefield and um, off the battlefield as well. So Amy did a couple of maps where she mapped where um, Jack was um, in, 19, in, in 1917 and 1918. We also have maps that are more storytelling based, such as um, the German assault on the Vergier um, during the Kaiserslaut. Um, where we try to give like almost like a minute by minute blow of what's going on um, during the battle as well. Um, we also have maps that were created by um, our student workers. So Benjamin Roy, who's one of our research assistants, did a couple of more storytelling based maps um, as well. We also have a timeline. Um, this is one of our more ambitious features. That's also one of our greatest failures um, in the sense of, you know, we are hoping to put all of these letters on a massive timeline. And the problem with web technology is that the more stuff you load into a browser, the easier it makes it to crash. <laughs> so we're, this is one of our ambitions that we want to try to split this up and do some more stuff with the letters on a time-based basis as well. And we also have information about um, Pierce's family. So a um, family tree that one of our student workers um, had worked through as well. All right, so that's a pretty over quick overview of the website. Um, and we'll go over a few more things during the rest of this presentation. Um, so I think it's your turn now, Ian. So uh, one of the things that we one of the things that we were um, very keen to do with the project is to use it as an instructional tool for students at Gettysburg College, and so um, the question was how do you do that? So how are we going to take an archival collection and how can we make it um, accessible to students, but also make it something in which they're going to learn something not only about the First World War but learn something about um, about the experience of war more generally or about how you use primary source materials, right? So uh, so essentially we have the collection, what do we do with it? We have the DH site, how do we actually start to use it? Now, the liberal arts classroom is a little bit different than working at a military academy or working within PME. 
So within my classes, there are a number of students that are taking the classes just because they have a peripheral interest in the topic. Some take the classes because of the requirements. Um, and so my course will fulfill a requirement that they want to get. So not everybody is super interested in military history or super interested in the history of warfare kind of more generally. So, uh, so when you're teaching military history at a liberal arts classroom, you need to kind of have a broad perspective of how you're going to teach the material and engage with students who have all kinds of different uh, learning, uh, learning backgrounds when it comes to the particular subject. So that being said, what we realized is we could use the site as kind of a micro history way of being able to teach something about the experience of war and in particular, the First World War. So Piers and his battalion in particular become a means of teaching both traditional military history and non-traditional military history. So we have materials within the collection that we can point to and say, okay, this battalion was engaged in these particular, uh, these particular battles we have maps to be able to show where they were in the trenches. We have war diary entries where we're able to show kind of what's going on. And so students are able to take that material and kind of piece together how the mechanics of warfare is working 1914 to 1918. So that's kind of the more traditional way in which we can use the material. The kind of non-traditional way that we can use the material is to be able to get students to engage more with First World War historiography. And what I mean by that is that the letters in and of themselves tell us something very interesting about the idea of the human experience of war. So you learn something about the morale of this battalion by looking at their combat performance over a long period. You learn something about Piers' coping mechanisms at the front. So what's he doing to be able to endure or to be able to survive at the front, right? Well, how does his family fit into it? What's the importance there? How is Piers seeing his own perspective of being a soldier? Is that tied to his perception of gender or his perception of masculinity? right? And the great thing about the field of First World War studies is it's a very interdisciplinary field where there's a lot of really innovative research on topics that are broadly history of war, but not as traditionally focused as military history and kind of drums and bugles or, uh, or, or battle and combat focused. So what students are able to do with this is they're able to take a letter collection by a fairly empathetic person and or person that they can empathize with potentially, and to be able to then connect some of that wider historiography and write papers about the particular letter, letter collection. Um, so that's one way in which they can, that, that they can engage with that material. One other way is by looking at traditional military history and realizing that we can maybe use digital tools to be able to tell that story in a more innovative or more engaging way, in particular for students who are not interested in kind of hard military history. So the maps that RC was pulling up for you are a good means to be able to, to do that. So if you pull up the map of the Battle of Luz that we set up within the site, you see the battalion in the first engagement. If you pull up the one from Guillemont in 1916, you see how they've learned to fight by 1916. So the difference between 1915 and 1916. And if you pull up the map from 1918, you see a very different but different battalion that's fighting in France, that's using all kinds of different uh, fighting methods that, 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 that they didn't have in 1915. So we're able to use the digital technology to tell both a traditional and a non-traditional story. And what we're trying to do now is to kind of move the site into the direction of looking at veterans and the conception of veteranhood, looking at some of the lives of these men who fought with peers after the war and what their lives might have actually looked like uh, when when they came home and to engage with the concept of the war's memory. How did the battalion remember their experiences afterward? RC, if you wouldn't mind uh, engaging the next slide. So one of the interesting things that we've done is we've been able to take students to France, uh, England, and Belgium as part of this project. Uh, we've taken our research assistants over um, to uh, to uh, twice to to France and to Belgium uh, once to once to England um, and during 1918 we did probably our most or, or sorry 2018 we did sorry 1918 but but in 2018 we did what I think is our most ambitious thing we went over as a team and did a real-time uh, battlefield tour of the opening phase of the Kaiser's battle the Kaiserschlag 
And so what we did is we went to locations in which the 8th Battalion was fighting. And we were there at the exact hour in which they were fighting in the Kaiserschlacht and on the exact location. And we were doing real-time battlefield tours with our students. Uh, and what you see here is a picture of me on a sunken road uh, in Le Verguier, France, talking to my students in the United States and giving them the lay of the land for the Kaiserschlag um, using, uh, using, uh, using Facebook Live or using live technology. So, uh, so we've been able to, or that, that was kind of our most ambitious project. We'd like to do a lot more with this, I think, in the future. But, uh, but we had a lot of fun in 2018 um, teaching students both in France and then, of course, back home. If you wouldn't mind going to, to the next slide, R.C. Uh, now, one of the things that we're particularly proud of is that we've assembled a team over the years that has trained a bunch of really talented student historians. And um, one of the things that we kind of insist on within uh, with, with, within our team is that we're all equal partners on the team and we insist on our students kind of carving out their own niche or their own area of interest in which they want to go into. And so you'll see here a list of our research assistants over the years, um, all of whom have gone off to, uh, to work in uh, either public history or in education or who have gone off to graduate school um, either at the master's level or the doctorate level. So we are particularly proud of the students that we've mentored on this project over the years. And that's kind of a, a big sort of feather in our cap is that we've not only kind of used this material in the classroom, we've also used it to be able to train um, train a whole bunch of next generation historians in not only traditional, what we would consider um, collections man ma management, kind of the archival side of things, but also in DH and in interpretation and public history as well. Uh, RC, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide. And so part of this is the aspect that our student workers are collaborators on the project. We mentor them. We insist that they get paid. Um, so we, uh, we, we, we are very we are very emphatic about that, that student labor is, uh, is, worth, is worth compensation and that they should be paid for their labor. So we've been able to pay our research assistants as well. Um, and one of the things that we've given our students is the ability to be able to take their interest and essentially run with it. So whatever they were interested in, they would take, they've brought to the table and they've been able to carve out their own niche within the particular project. Uh, Amy, I think I'm gonna hand it over to you for field work now. All right, so as Ian said, we have been extremely lucky to cobble together funding to travel to Europe with students twice in support of this project. And we actually did have a trip planned for 2020 and had a trip planned for 2021 and are somewhat hopeful there might be a trip in 2022, but we do have funding for a third, third visit. Um, I'm gonna go through them and just kind of give a little bit of an idea of what we did for each, um, for each trip. Um, in 2016, we were in France, Belgium, and the UK, and we started just, we arrived in France just prior to the 100th anniversary of the Battle of the Somme, and then we were actually in London during the anniversary. Uh, we visited peers-related sites in France and Belgium and London. We conducted archival research at the Imperial War Museum and the UK National Archives in the Surrey History Center, and this trip gave our team really much needed context for both the war experience of peers and of his battalion. We visited cemeteries that dotted the French countryside, as well as the Mayfair neighborhood where Piers spent his time in London. We got soaked searching for the 24th Division Monument in Battersea Park and witnessed active modern memorials to the Battle of the Somme anniversary that were going on throughout London uh, in that year. Um, we also went to Piers' hometown of Carshall in Surrey, where we met a local historian and got absolutely drenched while we attending a last post ceremony at the war monument that was unveiled by Piers in 1922 and that he writes about in his letters and has a program from the dedication of. And that is the photo on the far right of your screen. Uh, next slide, RC. In 2018, we were able to return to France and Belgium during the anniversary of the German Spring Offensive. And this, as Ian said, had a more ambitious plan we, uh, we wanted to bring the First World War battlefield back to Gettysburg, and we did it through live social media video feeds and linking to Gettysburg College classes through video conferencing. And 
at this point, it was the time of Skype rather than the time of Zoom. And when I was thinking about this today, it really, all of our preparations for this visit seem kind of quaint at this point. I feel like now we would go and click on Zoom on my phone and it would be much more easy, <laughs> much easier experience. Um, while we were in France, we Skyped into three classes live uh, from locations significant to the 8th Battalion and did seven Facebook Live broadcasts 100 years to the moment in the location of the events we were describing. Um, and this all surrounded the defense of the Verguier, a small French village uh, during the spring offensive. In addition to that, we made local co connections in the town of Le Verguier, relying heavily on our student Megan O'Donnell, class of 2016, who is pictured in the center picture in the black coat. Uh, she speaks French fluently and we honestly, would have been a little bit of a mess without her. Uh, we met the current mayor and the deputy mayor of Le Vergue, as well as the grandson and great grandson of their wartime mayor. So we even we ended up even taking, I would say about half the men in the town and a local newspaper reporter along with us on our quest to locate the 8th Battalion's headquarters in Le Vergue. And we were pretty successful, although we ended up looking over into a private lot that had a fence that we couldn't get into, despite the mayor knowing the owner of the land and calling, you know, he had his phone number in his phone and was calling, but they weren't home. Um, so by paying attention to the town story and listening to their living memories of the war, we learned a lot. They shared photographs and documents from their own records with us and from their own collections. They let us explore the church bell tower that was paid for and dedicated as a living memorial by the men, to the men of the 24th division um, in, 1920, in 1926. Um, as on our previous trip, we also visited many, many memorials and cemeteries and a few museums. Being from Gettysburg, either consciously or unconsciously, we had that comparison of battlefield and monument buzzing in the background all the time. And we really felt the impact of individual names carved into the memorials of the men whose bodies were never found and that really kind of appreciated the Herculean efforts to provide headstones for those who were found by the uh, Commonwealth Graves Commission. Um, so in recent posts on jackpierce.org, we've made an effort to tell some of these individual stories and uh, briefly profile the men of the battalion as RC mentioned. We added the soldier, soldier's profile page um, and worked on it throughout the pandemic um, to bring the, a little bit of background research to the soldiers who Jack sometimes referred to as my lambs. And it was a good pandemic project because we were able to all work on it remotely and then continue to contribute to the site during the pandemic. That's the end for me. Right. Next slide. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna sort of wrap up my portion of here before I turn it back over to Ian. When thinking about digital remembrance and memorialization, um, and, you know, when Amy is mentioning, you know, these memorials on locate, you know, in France and Belgium in the United Kingdom, you know, we have these memorials that are carved in stone that are there to be, you know, reminders of anyone who passes by. Um, or anyone who actively seeks out these sites of remembrance and memorialization, um, you know, so it kind of makes it, it, for me, when I was thinking about how do we, you know, especially after we ran out of the letters, we started moving to the social profiles, how are other ways we can think about remembrance and memorialization in a digital, um, in a digital concept? And Lizzie Hobbs, her spreadsheet of you know, almost 1,200 men, you know, I began looking through instance, like seeing what common data points exist, what can we think of as, you know, what are, what are ways we can think about these men, um, you know, in their lives and the sacrifices that they made. And about 500 of them had some sort of known hometown that was recorded in the spreadsheet. And another 650 had some sort of known place of burial or memorialization. So I sort of dived into, you know, trying to like think about these, um, how can we do something a little different as well? So I spent some time and created a um, map that is intended to sort of like bridge um, you know, the cradle and the grave of many of these men. 
and also try to think about how can we analyze you know where these men came from um, as well so by taking their um, information about what we knew about their births but also their death we could i built this map and as you start digging in you can see where these men came from and if you, you click on and click down you can see you know generally about you know the it's about the neighborhood of where they were born um and these are all gathered together. Um, so once you start, when you cross the um, channel though, then you start seeing where they died um, or where they're, at least where their place of memorialization is because we don't know where all of them are buried. Um, and as you click through, you know, every poppy represents one of these soldiers who is buried and memorialized in these places. Um, and, you know, you can see they're pretty clustered. You know, we have a few outliers um, here and there. Um, we, have one in we have one born in Canada even um, on the map. But you can sort of see, you know, most of these men came from the south of England and most of them died um, in Northern France. Um, and, you know, this is, a, you could take a spreadsheet and sort of gather this information by looking at it yourself. But the visceral sort of like looking at it, it's like, you know, it's, it adds this, this digital concept of it, of having a, like this place where we can memorialize their, their acts and brings, you know, bring, try to bring the sheer number of men involved in the Great War in our small, you know, sample of who we have and, you know, try to build this sort of, memorial to them. Another concept was an idea of thinking about when, you know, this sort of like time-based visualization of when their deaths happened. Um, so this is another way of, of memorialization as well, and but also sort of giving sort of this visceral response to, you know, we see some deaths and this sort of creeps up here a little bit as we're going through um, the times, but every once in a while, um, depending on the engagements that the men are in, you'll see things starting to creep up a little bit. And when you see the engagements where they're really, where they do definitely see a lot of action, all of a sudden, you know, we start seeing these numbers creep up and creep up where they're memorialized. So, this gives us a way to, you know, for me, it was the act of building this stuff was my own way of like providing a memorial to them, but also to give anyone who comes to the site to just see a, a bigger picture of the war and realize that every person, you know, was, you know, there was someone's son's, you know, possibly someone's brother, possibly someone's husband, um, and try to in, try to pull, bring a wider pull the wider picture back, but also narrow it down um, as well. And hopefully we can find more ways to continue the sort of memorialization throughout from the website too. We're almost to the end of the war here. So I'll kick it over to Ian for end here. So yeah, so I just want to wrap up just quickly. What's next for the project? So we have some time for some questions. Um, a, few, a few things. I just put some questions down here. First, uh, we want to further develop our historical context for it. And we're trying to focus again more on the lives of the men in the, in the battalion. We know reasonably well what happened in Jack Pierce's life, but this is an area that we want to expand into and we've tried to expand into during the pandemic. Um, we want to examine research into the post-war lives of members of the battalion. We know a little bit about some of these guys, but not nearly enough. And I think it would be very interesting to tell the story of homecoming since we've gotten to know this battalion pretty intimately to show the story of homecoming or what happens essentially after war. Um, and then finally, Amy told me I'm supposed to plug this. Uh, initially, I went into this project 
thinking that I wasn't going to write a traditional book on the battalion. And then in the pandemic, I decided to write a traditional book on the battalion. So uh, so I, I'm finishing up a book right now. It'll be available through Pen and Sword um, probably next year. That's called the, um, the, the, the Battalion Citizen Soldiers in the Western Front. And it's a book about peers, the Eighth Queens, and how a battalion, a uh, citizen battalion, changes and evolves over the course of a war of attrition. So uh, for those of you who are traditional book people, there will be a book on this group that's going to be coming out in the future. So uh, we've time for some questions. Um, I'm going to field uh, one of them right now that popped up in the Q&A. Uh, it's from Vanessa. And it's during our research, did you come across how the pan pandemic flu affected these soldiers? Uh, so in the writing of the uh, book, I did come across references to the flu, um, to the 1918 flu. The battalion seems to have gotten slightly fortunate, if that's a word that I could use. They were hit with the first wave of the influenza, not the more deadly second wave that happens later in the winter. They're hit with the first wave of the flu in the summer of 1918. And there's uh, hundreds of guys go, go down with influenza within kind of a two or three week period. So it kind of rips through the battalion, um, but it doesn't, kill, um, it, it doesn't kill that many men that we know about. A lot of these guys end up in hospital, but that's kind of where we lose track of them. Um, later on, though, there are some officers that we know of that do die of the later flu in the winter of 1918. Um, but the way it's categorized in the records, it's sometimes not directly flu, they have influenza, and then they die from bronchitis or pneumonia later on. So, um, so we don't have a ton of information, but we do know that the flu does affect the battalion in the summer of 1918. It's also affecting the Germans on the other side, too. Hey, uh, we got some questions on chat. I'll, I'll start. Uh, this one uh, uh, came from Richard. He says, what was the tone of the commemoration for the Somme when you were in the UK? And how did your students respond to those experiences? I know the public perception of battle has often tended to be towards tragic. So I can talk a little bit about that. One of the um, one of the things that I remember the most, and I and I don't know how I feel about it exactly. A little conflicted, and I think our students were too. I think one of them was really struck with it, and one of them kind of had the same questioning feeling that I did. Um, there were um, there were individuals dressed as First World War soldiers who were present in train stations and other public places, and they were fully kitted out and would walk around, but they wouldn't talk to anyone, they wouldn't engage with you. If you approached them, they would hand you a slip of paper that had kind of the details of whatever person they were representing. So it was a little bit of living history, but there it wasn't really... Uh, kind of face-to-face, -face it wasn't that kind of um, engagement that you sometimes see, especially in Gettysburg. So they were there, and I believe the project was We Are Here, and it was to just remind people of how present the war had been in people's lives during that time, where you were just going about your daily business, you would, you would encounter soldiers, you would see people on the trains, you would see people in public places. And that was... Um, it was somber, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't sad, it wasn't too tragic. But it was it was that kind of constant reminder. It was it was a serious uh, reminder. So that was the one that kind of stood out to me. Uh, the events that we did in Karshalton were pretty traditional. They played the last post. They had kind of a color guard situation, um, but there wasn't there wasn't much more than that happening there. This question um, comes from Barry. Uh, he wants to know if the peers' letters were affected by military censors. Ian, you're muted. Yeah, so Piers, um, so, his, so his letters would have gone through a fellow officer who would have read them. Um, Piers jokes about the censor within his letters, which is actually very interesting. So, um, but there's nothing in his letters that's crossed out and censored. And to be perfectly frank, some of the stuff early in the war that he's writing home probably should have been. Um, but he doesn't give away... It, he doesn't give away essential military details, and he jokes with his parents that he, you know, he'll say things like, well, I could tell you where we are, but the censor would get angry with me. But then he essentially kind of hints as to where they are. Um, how is this collection reflected in your library catalog? Um, so it 
It, I'm not sure that it's in the catalog yet, but I did send the, I put the link in the chat that will take them to the digital collection of letters. That is kind of our, our straight up just database of letter and transcription. And then um, RC dropped in the link to the website where there's more con the context that we've been showing you. Well, I was going to ask that, and then is it will be available in WorldCat. So it, if someone's just looking World 1 1, they might stumble upon this resource that you've put together. Yeah, it will get cataloged. We're just, you know, it just uh, was finished processing last spring, and then all, you know, our students went home. So we're working on it, but More it will library. definitely, yeah, well, it'll definitely appear course. in the catalog. And it is, um, you know, if you do search for peers, you will get results of this digital collection that RC has up on the screen now. And then between RC and you, what type of metadata did you build into the digital component? I, it's for my own edification right now. <laughs> no, I love this question. Um, so <laughs> we worked with our um, digital projects coordinator who works in special collections from the beginning. So initially when the items were digitized and um, we did them with the same metadata we would do for all of our collections. So it includes kind of the title, the names, the dates. Um, and then what was special to this collection was actually adding in uh, local subjects and from a controlled vocabulary, controlled vocabulary that our project that came out of our project, as well as locations, so that um, the letters can be pulled together by where they were written as well as when they were written. Because um, he's writing mostly to the same people over and over again, it's yeah. not as, you know, there wasn't as much with the people involved, but um, the subjects were all, um, were all kind of that subject heading was um, initiated by a student who came to me and said, we need a controlled vocabulary. And I said, yes, you can definitely do that. And she worked with, um, with other librarians to make that happen. Yeah, oh. if, you go, if you're on a letter on the website, on the on the actual digital project, every letter right. has these tags, so you can click on a tag, um, and that gives you every letter that pulls together every letter that's tagged in that way with that controlled vocabulary. Okay. Uh, what type of reaction did you get when you published the letters based upon the timeline of the activity of, uh, for the 100th commemoration? So we got, um, so we tended to get most of our action uh, during battle anniversary times uh, because there was a wider World War I community that was either live tweeting stuff or that was visiting battlefields around that time. So one of the examples that I can give is during the Kaiserschlacht, there was a, um, a Twitter account called the Kaiser's Battle that was actually amazingly well done, that was coordinating a minute by minute play by play of how the Kaiser Schlacht um, went down from both sides of the trench line. And so we, they retweeted our stuff. We were a part of that dialogue. So most of the stuff that we were seeing on social media tended to be during battle anniversaries, I'd say. Is that fair, Amy, do you think? Yeah, I would say that definitely. We have had um, contact made by some relatives, some descendants of peers or other, you know, member from different branches of his family. And then we've had um, some contact from descendants of men from the battalion. And that's been very interesting. I had a, in one of our previous slides, we showed a picture of a man that we, um, that first contacted us online. And then we actually met when we were in France because he was, um, he was there to commemorate his grandfather's experience as well. Yeah, we're gonna use some of your examples. We did something similar with the gentleman by the name of Munder who went missing and then was found about a year and a half later. And all we have all the letters from his family to the War Department trying to figure out what happened to their son. Uh, so what you've done here is a, is, a, is a great example. I have another question here from Clarice. Did you have any discussions with the producers of the films, They Shall Never Grow Old? No, we That was didn't. a World War, uh, a, a British film that looked at the, the legacy of the, uh, the soldiers. Yeah, we did. We saw it as a team, and we actually had um, us and some of our students actually put um, wrote like review, but like reactions to it. So I'll see if I can find it, and I can throw that in the chat really quick. So, and we really have no more questions. I, I have a commentary for Ian, who, who talks about teaching military history at a uh, 
liberal arts college. I taught military history at a military college. And my engineering students were sometimes just as excited about being in mill art as were uh, uh, some of your uh, humanity students because they wanted to be engineers. They weren't, didn't want to be historians. So it was one of those required courses they had to, to live through. So uh, it's, it's not just unique to, to the liberal arts, uh, liberal arts world. Uh, any closing comments from, from uh, either, any of you? No, thank you for having us. It's been a pleasure, pleasure talking with all of you and answering some of your questions. Okay. Uh, again, uh, Amy, anything? Uh, no, just thank you for having us and everyone enjoy the site. Well, I'm going to try to encourage people to get to it. Uh, RC, do you have anything as the, the technologist on the on the group? You're, you're muted. Of course, I'm muted. I'm the one who screws it up. Um, <laughs> no, don't feel. Free. This is this sort of work is great um, and interact with it. And this pub, being public, we love your feedback. So you know, let us know what you think as you go through it. Well, we'll be posting this up on YouTube and hopefully over a period of time it gets lots of views and it does bring more questions to you. Uh, anybody, they, they can email anybody that's on the team or contact anybody that's on the team. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to probably wander down your way and sit down with some of you too because uh, it's a great educational product and it's something I think our foundation, uh, as we partner with the user heck, would like to, to get done. Uh, in closing, I, I'm going to advertise next week's talk. Uh, next week, we, we move back into the 21st century. Uh, we have William Narr, Mike Nuttich, and Robert Pennington uh, from the Joint Special Operations Press that are going to talk about the first battle of uh, the, uh, the, the conflict that just th theoretically ended a month and a half ago. Uh, they're going to talk about, about Maurice Al Sharif, the first victory of the 21st century against terrorism. Uh, so it, it, we're going to move up to another century here, and hopefully you'll join it. It'll be next uh, Wednesday, the 3rd of November at 7 p.m. So again, thank you, uh, Amy, Ian, and RC for tonight, and thank you in the audience uh, for joining us. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.